just want to say again how much I appreciate being here with you folks and being in the spirit and particularly of uh, having Helen May with me. We've had a, an enjoyable trip down. We, she's got a whole big batch of files on President Benson and she brought him with me and we read Desert Clark Benson from Alpine to Snowflake. <laughs> and it was just a thrilling experience to read through <clears throat> discourse after discourse that he's given. And uh, uh, as I drive along, she'd read and we'd discuss and <clears throat> say, hey, that's a great idea. What can we work that one in? See? But uh, <clears throat> it's a thrill and a pleasure to be with you. <clears throat> Our subject for this last hour is the idea of Zion. As you read some of the early sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 11, section 12, section 14, then it's easy to remember because they're all verse 6 in those three revelations, and they all say the same thing. And the thing that they say, as in verse 6, Now as you have asked, behold, I say unto you, keep my commandments and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. The Prophet Joseph Smith, for example, makes this statement as he talks about uh, the importance of Zion. This is the teachings, page 160. We ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object is our greatest object. Now, some people say teaching the gospel is the greatest work, and other people say the redemption of the bread is the greatest work. <clears throat> and uh, there's ways in which that comment needs to be understood that make it more meaningful. But uh, the building of Zion will include both of them. <clears throat> and so if there's an end of controversy, controversy it will be on this. Now, we need to build Zion not just as something that's going to happen in the last days. We need to build Zion for our salvation. Let me put it this way. No person will enter into the celestial kingdom as an heir to be exalted therein who has not established in his life the principles, the knowledge, the doctrine, and the program of Zion. You become exalted by becoming a Zion people, and to the degree we are a Zion people, we are prepared for celestial existence. And the building of Zion, then, is not just something for the millennium, it's something that I need to do if I ever expect to be exalted in the celestial kingdom, because exaltation is not based on any other principle. You cannot neglect the building of Zion and be exalted. It just cannot be done. And you cannot neglect understanding the principles and the doctrine of Zion and be exalted. It simply cannot be done. And you can be baptized and get into the celestial kingdom and be a ministering angel and run around loose in eternity as a freelance <coughs> celestial being, as it were, sealed, however, to some family. <coughs> But uh, you cannot be exalted unless you have internalized, learned and internalized the principle of Zion. Here in section 105, as the Lord spoke to the saints in June of 1834, at a place we called Fishing River in Missouri, uh, the setting is Zion's camp, which had traveled this thousand miles thereabouts from Kirtland to Missouri, to give the saints support in being reinstated upon their lands. And uh, while they got there, when they got there, the Lord gave this revelation. Verse 2, Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil. And do not impart with their substance, as becometh saints, to the poor and afflicted among them, and are not united <clears throat> according to the union required by the law of the celestial Canaan. That union is a union based on spirit, testimony, the revelations of 
God's will and mind in each person, which brings a natural union. And he says, And Zion, verse 5, cannot be built up unless it is by the principles and the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. Now, that last phrase is very, very important. And it has more than one application. It means for the here and now, for this earth, that Christ will not come in the second coming until he has a people established on the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. You can talk about the second coming, you can speculate when it's going to take place, but you write this down, that he will not come in his glory and in his power until there is a body of people living the full law of the document covenants concerning Zion. It simply will not be, because he cannot come and receive them unto himself. And then that extension goes on into the resurrection. He cannot receive us as his people, and we be his people in the resurrection, except it's on the basis that we have received, embraced, applied, internalized the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. See? And so this is very important. Now, in the inspired revision of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, there is an interesting uh, statement there that uh, has its basis in a covenant which the Lord made initially with Enoch and then renewed with Noah. And this applies then in its fulfillment to us in the latter day, or to that body of people who will finally build Zion in preparation for Christ's millennial reign. In verse 17 of the inspired revision of Genesis 19, I will establish my covenant with you which I made unto Enoch, speaking now to Noah, concerning the remnant of your posterity. And God made a covenant with Noah and said, This shall be the token of the covenant I make between me and you for every living creature with you for perpetual generations. I will set my bow, that is the rainbow, in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which I have made between me and you for every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and remember the everlasting covenant which I made with thy father Enoch. And here is the gist of the covenant. That when men should keep all my commandments. Zion should again come on the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up into myself. And this is my everlasting covenant, speaking now to know that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, see, those members of that church are mainly on up there, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, and shall possess the earth, and shall have place unto the income, and this is mine everlasting covenant which I made with thy father Enoch. Now note the symbolism there, the symbolism of the rainbow, which acts then in symbol uh, as the veil between us here and those up there. And when we then, under the great canopy of the rainbow, <clears throat> embrace the gospel and quit looking at mundane things, earthly things, and look upward instead with the Spirit of the Lord in our lives, and receive all the truths and apply all the principles of the gospel, when we do this, then Zion up there will look down, and the General Assembly of the Church of the Firstborn, the Church about the veil, will then come down out of heaven and have place on earth. See. Now, what does that imply must needs be done before the second coming? We've got to build Zion. See, we've got to build Zion. Now, <clears throat> Zion is to be established before the millennium. And if I can say so, and venture to say so, years before the millennium. 
decades before the millennium. Zion must be established before the millennium and will exist for a period of time. For example, here in section 45, beginning with verse 66, the Lord is here talking <coughs> about the last days, and you just take this statement and analyze it, face value, what it's saying. <coughs> verse 66, it should come to be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God, and the glory of the Lord shall be there. That's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And the terror of the Lord also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come up with him and shall be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take up his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And they shall be gathered into an out of every nation under heaven, and shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. I ask yourself this question. Is that talking about the millennium? Obviously not. There's wicked people. There's a situation where either you take up your sword and flee to Z against your neighbor, or you flee to Zion. Uh, is it talking about the period after the millennium? And obviously not. Now, what period is it talking about? A period before the millennium, right? And this is an extended period of time, as we understand the prophetic picture. And uh, uh, in this time, then, Zion will arise with great power. Here in section 64 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaks of Zion in this period of time. And he says, And behold, I say unto you that Zion shall flourish and the glory of the Lord shall be upon her, and she shall be an ensign unto the people." Now, what's an ensign? Well, it's something to which you look. Anciently, at time of battle, they carried an ensign, and the ensign then showed the troops where to focus attention and where to move it. Uh, an ensign is something to which you look for direction. And it shall be an ensign unto the people, and there shall come unto her out of every nation under heaven, and the day shall come, when the nations of the earth shall tremble because of her, and shall fear because of her terrible ones. Now, before the millennium? Obviously so. You see that? And so the program then is that we need to, to build Zion, and that means then we need to kind of get an idea of what Zion is all about. Now, we have statements in the scripture that help us on this subject. Uh, section 97 of the Doctrine and Covenants tells us uh, concerning Zion, and it has some other things we'll come back to later in relation to uh, Zion, but in the midst of the explanation, he says this in verse 24, or 21 rather, Therefore verily thus saith the Lord of Zion rejoice, for this is Zion, the pure in heart. Therefore, let Zion rejoice, while all the wicked shall mourn." And so one of the, the uh, most distinctive qualities, then, of Zion is a people, then, who are pure in heart. And that purity has to come through the gospel, and has to come through the sanctifying power of the gospel. Uh, another statement, for example, that helps us to understand the idea of Zion is what the Lord said uh, here in the book of Moses about the uh, order that Enoch built up. See, Enoch and his people uh, established the Zion society in their midst. And note what uh, the Lord says about them. This is uh, uh, Moses 7, beginning with verse uh, uh, 16 through 21. And from that time forth there were wars and bloodshed among them, for the Lord came and dwelt with his people. Now the Savior then, as a prayer of spirit, came and dwelt with Zion. And likewise, the Savior will come to the latter-day Zion, and he will dwell with the latter-day saints for years and for decades before he comes to the world in glory. Now, when we talk about as latter-day saints preparing for the second coming, personally, I'm not thinking about his coming to the world in glory. That's uh, looking beyond the mark. The thing I'm thinking about is when Isaiah 59 is fulfilled, that the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and from there to those then who turn from ungodliness in Jacob, see. And this is much closer. This is much, much closer 
has a period of time. I don't venture to prophesy, but uh, we're living at a time then that is very, very near when many people will personally and individually see and receive instructions from Christ our Redeemer. As I've said then, he will be in Zion for years prior to his coming in glory. I will get to that when we talk about the prophetic picture uh, this evening and tomorrow evening and Saturday evening. Now it goes on here in the book of Moses and says, The fear of the Lord was upon all nations, so great was the glory of the Lord which was on his people. See, they had the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They had the endowment uh, of glory which naturally belongs to the, to the people of the saints. If we don't have it, we're not saints. We're ancient complaints. We're not saints. If we're really saints, we'll have the endowment of glory. And I've looked over top of my house several times, and I've never seen it. <clears throat> and I haven't seen it over anyone else's either. I've had some beautiful spiritual experiences, and so have all of us, see? But we're not right there. All right, so the glory of the Lord was upon the people, and this was so concentrated that they were, there was fear upon all nations because of that divine endowment. And he says, And the Lord blessed the land, and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places, and did flourish. And the Lord called his people Zion, and here's why now, because they were of one heart and one mind. Now, that doesn't contradict the old statement in section 97, Zion is the pure in heart. You can't have one heart and one mind except on the basis of purity. And the two then go together. They were Zion because they were one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them, which meant they had the economic program of the kingdom. You see that? And they applied it. And they were sanctified, and they, they had the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place. And inside the house they had Pentecost and the gifts of the Spirit and the blessings and the endowments of the Spirit. See? Now, those are the things that we should be looking for as a people and working toward. Some of us think that we can handle the endowment of glory. Let me tell you, you can't handle it without a preparatory action. You can't handle it. You simply cannot be done unless there is a preparation for it, and that preparation then is accomplished then through service and through devotion and through the study of the scriptures and through fasting and through prayer and through personal discipline and through the meekness of Christ in our lives. See, it simply cannot be handled because the endowment is such, and it's so dynamic and so forceful and powerful, and with it goes the responsibility of the greater endowment that opens up the onslaught of the adversary against the individual, commensurate with what he's received. And so we have to work and prepare for the endowment of Zion with glory. And the Lord goes on and says, He continued his preaching in righteousness of the people, and it came to pass in his day that they built a city which was called the City of Holiness, even Zion. Now, this means to me that <clears throat> Zion has both a spiritual and what may be called a natural or temporal basis. It has the law of consecration and stewardship as a basis. But above all, it has the foundation of spiritual renewal, people who have been born again, people who have been changed and transformed spiritually, people who have awakened unto God and who enjoy the spirit of revelation and the gifts of the Spirit. And it's right at this point where the rubber meets the road that President Benson is talking to us today. See? And it's for this reason that so many of us are under condemnation. See? Because we're saying all is well in Zion. Look at the number of temples we've built in the last five years. Look at the number of missionaries we've got out. And essentially, we are aping the ways of the Gentiles, economically and socially, and we've translated the achievement in that realm and made it a substitute for getting the gifts of the Spirit and living by the Spirit and getting the revelations of the Spirit and getting the love of God in our hearts. See? And we've done that to the extent that we have turned to secularism and materialism, and there's lethargy in our midst. And we don't want to listen too much to the gospel because it just isn't of interest and it's, after all, hard to understand. And yet, here we are with the challenge then of, of building Zion. 
Let me give you this definition of Zion. Zion is a body of saints established on the full program and covenants of the gospel so that they so that they that are partakers of the truth and power so that they are partakers of the truth and power of God and made pure in heart, united in one mind and heart, sealed to eternal life and lives by the holy priesthood and endowed with God's glory as a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now the day will come when as Latter day Saints, some of us at least, will come to the standard. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi puts nineteen chapters, or there are at least nineteen chapters, from Isaiah. Many of them are put there by Nephi, and then the Savior puts one there, and then Abinadi puts a full chapter there. But uh, a couple of these chapters uh, of Isaiah are chapters three and four. And they both deal with the Latter-day Saints and the cleansing that's going to come to the Saints. And uh, in that day of cleansing, and I'm reading now from Second Nephi 14, verse 2, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. This is that group that will finally be refined out from among the Latter-day Saints. And when you get to the other end of the tunnel, after severe and critical cleansings and judgments, as Isaiah said, Zion shall redeem the judgment and her converts with righteousness, then that group that comes out at the other end of the tunnel will indeed be a Zion people. They may be sitting out here somewhere in the desert, but they'll have the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They'll have Pentecost in their midst. And in that day, Isaiah says, talking of them, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful, and glorious from the fruit of the earth, excellent and comely to them that are escaped of Israel. And then he says, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of flaming fire by night. And upon all the glory of Zion shall be a defense. Instead of having Star Wars as a method of defense, we'll have the endowment of glory. And it'll be a defense to the saints, and uh, it'll be a lot less costly than the present program, if I may add. Mm. All right, now, Zion then isn't really Zion until we come to this point. And Nephi tells us that this point is going to be achieved through opposition. In First Nephi 14, he sees this great uh, era of warfare against Zion, which I I think we discussed with you when I was here before, and uh, this becomes an important key because it's out of this setting that Zion finally arises and becomes the standard and end Zion that she's supposed to be. No, Nephi sees that the multitudes among all nations are gathered together to fight against Zion, and that will include the American nation against the saints, and it will be something more than the media. It will be military, and it will be it will be lawlessness, and it will be a devastating kind of thing where the Lord will have to step in to preserve his people. But he says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now that's where Zion begins to rise and be an ensign, under those circumstances. And then Zion becomes what may be called Mount Zion. And the two terms then have a distinct meaning. And let me just spend a little time with you now on the, the term Mount Zion. But let's first of all turn to section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants to get the, uh, an introduction to what the Lord has to say about it here in this early revelation as he speaks uh, to the saints clear back here in January of uh, rather, September of, of 1832. In verse 2 he says, Verily the word of the Lord concerning his church established in the last days for the restoration of his people as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. 
And then having said that, he explains, which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western region or boundaries of the state of Missouri, and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, Jr., and others with whom the Lord is well pleased. Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city, New Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. And that's one time where men failed, but the Lord didn't. And so, in section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he cancels out the immediate responsibility, he doesn't cancel out the ultimate fulfillment, but for that day then he set the work aside. He says, For verily this generation, speaking of the original declaration, shall not all pass away until a house shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord which shall fill the house. And then, as he comes back to that same theme in verse 31, after talking about the sons of Moses and of Aaron in the priesthood, not their sons in the flesh, sons in the priesthood, he then says in verse 34, Therefore I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which I shall be built in the Lord in this generation upon this consecrated spot as I have appointed. And the sons of Moses and of Aaron shall be filled with the glory of the Lord upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house, whose sons are ye, and also many whom I have called, and so forth." See? All right, the Lord's desire, then, is to do what? To build Mount Zion. And uh, Mount Zion is to be endowed with glory, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. And the sons of Moses and Aaron, the sons in priesthood of Moses and Aaron, then are to be endowed with this glory. And had the Lord's program gone forward and the saints been as faithful as they ought to have done, that would have happened in that generation. But we have a more sad story to tell. See. Now, people who become celestial people are people who are established on Mount Zion. Note, for example, what the Lord says in section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse uh, 66, as he speaks now of the celestial kingdom. And he says, These are they who are, are come unto Mount Zion. These are they who are come. They've arrived. They've been there. Their lives were established on that program, and hence they are celestial. See, These are they who are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiness, the, the holiest of all. Uh, in the vision, for example, of Christ and the saints on Mount Zion, you have reported this in section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord uh, refers to uh, a time yet future, and this period of time, if I can just make a clarification, pertains to that period immediately before Christ comes uh, <clears throat> to the Jews and immediately before he comes in the clouds of heaven. So there's a great work to be done, developing things before he gets to that point where he comes then to the Jews and to the, the world in the, the clouds of heaven. And he speaks of that in verse 17, beginning, For behold, the Lord God hath sent forth the angel crying through the midst of heaven, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight, for the hour of his coming is nigh. When the Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Wherefore, prepare for the coming of the bridegroom, go ye, go ye out to meet him." See? Now, he's talking then about incidents prior to and preparatory developments for the second coming. And the reference is back, for example, to Revelation chapter 14. Uh, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, chapter 14. And that particular uh, chapter begins, then, with John the Revelator seeing Christ as he stands on Mount Zion just before the Second Coming, where there is a great division between the people. The righteous, then, on one hand, gathered to Zion, and Mount Zion established, and Christ and 144,000 with him. And then, on the other hand, <clears throat> the wicked of the world. 
And as John sees that then, he writes as follows, beginning with verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of the great thunder, and I heard the har voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sang as it were a new song. The four beasts, and we'll talk about that uh, Saturday night, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. And these were they which were not defiled with women. Now, it doesn't say that the bachelors or some kind of celibates. Uh, these are they, he says, uh, who are virgins. And these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Uh, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. Let me just make this clarification. All of these good brethren are married men. All of them are. They are men who hold fullness of the priesthood. You can't give a man fullness of priesthood except it's in the marriage relationship. See, They're called virgins. Why? And they're called not defiled with women. Why? That doesn't mean that women are some kind of uh, creatures that you can get defiled with and they're, you know, they've, they've, they've got uh, uh, some kind of dread disease. They're, uh, they're lepers <coughs> and you just don't get in their presence. Now, it doesn't have that connotation. It's talking about men who are sanctified. It's talking about men who have applied the physical endowments in the right way, and hence then are undefiled. And they're virgins, just like the ten virgins represent the whole church, men and women, you see. And the virgin principle indicates then the purity of their character. It doesn't indicate the marriage status there. It indicates the purity of their character. But the truth is, as section 77 makes it very clear, that these are men who hold the keys uh, to bring people into the church of the firstborn, friends of priesthood and the sealing powers. And to get to that level of development, only those things are only given by and in and through the sacred covenants of eternal marriage. So all of these brethren are married. But it says, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And uh, in their mouths was no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, the 144,000 then have a special relationship with Christ. They follow him whithersoever he shall go. They are the great harvest uh, <clears throat> program of the latter day. Men who are endowed with powers of the priesthood to bring people into the church of the firstborn, saying, and all of this will be done. And you finally come to the point where, where the saints will stand on Mount Zion with Christ and the 144,000 before the second coming. Now, to get to that point, then, Christ will come to the saints in Zion years before, years before. And there will be a development in relation to the Zion program and the building of that Zion program. And then it will consummate in him standing on Mount Zion with 144,000, ready now to institute the great and final events that bring his millennial reign into power, the cleansing of the earth, the going to the Jews and the cleansing and the final coming in glory. See, now that's the picture we need to get. And we need to see then, first things first, we need to see where we are. We need to see that we've got a living prophet that's saying, hey, we need to get sanctified. We are running behind time spiritually. We are not where we ought to be as a church in relation to spiritual renewal and the knowledge of the Book of Mormon. We've got a prophet who we thought was just going to talk about politics. But instead, he talks about the most vital and important things. Not that politics are unimportant. I have three degrees in politics, and for whatever that's worth, <laughs> but at least... Uh, they are important, and they have an important role to play. But politics isn't worth a hoot, if I can put it that way, except by a virtuous people, and by a people then who are sanctified. The Founding Fathers established this nation with the intent that it could not be sustained except by virtuous people. And we'll prove that statement true if we don't watch it. All right, so Mount Zion will be established. Now, what is Mount Zion? 
What does it mean? Well, let me just explore the idea. Uh, let's first of all start with the word mount. And I'm using now as a noun, not a verb. Uh, Use as a verb, oh, go mount your horse. Yeah, that's a verb. Now let's use it as a noun. What is a mount? Well, a mount is that upon which something rests or is established for use or, or for exhibition. It, for example, is the card, etc., upon which a drawing or photograph is mounted. It's the mount, the basic mount. It's a saddle horse used for riding. That's your mount. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Okay? They are on the mount. The mount is that on which they sit, on which they rest. And so, primarily then, a mount used as a noun is a foundation, a platform, a basis on which something else is established. Okay? Now, that's one meaning. Another meaning is that it's an elevation, as in the earth's surface. When used as part of a proper name, it usually precedes the specific application as, for example, Mount Washington, or Mount this, or Mount that. See? It's an elevated thing. Now, put the two ideas together, the two points combined. The mount, then, is the divine order of principles, ordinances, and powers on which Zion rests, by which she is elevated as a true ensign and standard to the world. Mount Zion is established on the sacred principles, rights, covenants, and powers of the temple and thereby elevated to be an ensign. Let me put it this way, that Zion is a temple-centered, temple-founded society, and Zion becomes Mount Zion when she is established upon the sacred covenants of the house of the Lord, the sacred covenant of obedience, the sacred covenant of sacrifice, the sacred covenant of the law of the gospel, which is the Sermon on the Mount in its pure statement, living outside ourselves in service to others, see? the sacred covenant of virtue and chastity, the sacred covenant of consecration by which we are prepared to enter through the veil into God's presence to be heirs of God and joint heirs through Christ. When we, instead of just getting our hands in the air, really establish our lives on that foundation and then go on to receive the sealing powers and the endowment of glory that comes through the sealing power, so that there is a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place, then we have, and then only, do we have Mount Zion. Or, in other words, then only do we have Zion established upon her mount, her mount being the order of rights, principles, powers sealing ordinances, fullness of priesthood, and endowment of the temple, see? Now, that is the way we need to move, and that's why it's so very, very important that we not only enter the temple to be married, but that we go back time and time and time again, so that we study the mount on which Zion is established, and we become familiar with it and we internalize it and make it part of our lives. And having been through the sacred ceremony of the Holy Endowment, and we sit quietly in the celestial room and we talk about how can we establish our lives on the sacred covenants that we've just made? How can we really do it, see? And this within the framework that the Prophet is establishing. How can I really become a temple saint? How can I really apply those things? Now, in that sense, then, uh, the temple is important, and it's not just uh, uh, something that we do now for the dead. I used to get the idea when I was a kid, you know, and was interested in the circus, that the church and the temple were something like a circus. In the circus, you have the big top, and that's where everything really takes place. 
And then out to the side over here, you have the little sideshows that go on. And uh, those sideshows are interesting. One, for example, in some years past, a guy was standing up saying, Come see the horse, but his tail where his head ought to be. And that was a real attractive thing. And people were lined up and put down their quarters and walked in. And they had a horse backed up in the stall <coughs> with his tail where his head ought to be. <coughs> and they passed on through, and they felt so chagrined and foolish about it <laughs> that they didn't want to be alone in it. <laughs> and so they never told their friends, but invited them to go see. And the little sideshow made lots of money, <coughs> and everyone went home chagrined. <laughs> now, getting back to the main theme, I get the idea, though, out of that whole show that somehow the Church is the big top, and the temple is the little sideshow outside. Now, if you just reverse the picture, you'll get a more clear picture. We're going to talk tomorrow quite at length about the relationship of the Church with the Holy Order built up in the temple. But uh, the point is this, that Zion is a temple-centered and temple-founded society, and it's only when we move, as it were, from membership in the Church and its activities, which are all important, but to really establishing our lives upon the temple and its covenants, and finally getting fullness of priesthood, which is only given in the temple, and then sanctifying our lives and coming to where we can receive the endowment of glory, that is the way to Zion. The way to Zion is not to pack up your trunk and head to Jackson County. The way to Zion is to do this other program scene. Now, this requires uh, that we have a temple. The prophet Joseph Smith, for example, put it this way. This is the teachings, page 308 and 9. He says, The main object was to build unto the Lord a house, whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom, and teach the people the way of salvation. For there are certain ordinances and principles that, when they are taught and practiced, must be done in a place or house built for that purpose. It was the design of the councils of heaven before the world, before the world was, that the principles and laws of the priesthood should be predicated upon the gathering of the people in every age of the world. Jesus did everything to gather the people, uh, and they would not be gathered, and he therefore poured out curses upon them, ordinances instituted in heaven before the foundation of the world, in the, the priesthood for the salvation of men, are not to be altered or changed, all must be saved on the same principle. He says it is for the same purpose that God gathers his saints in the last days to build unto the Lord a house, to prepare them for the ordinances and endowments of washings and anointings, etc. He says if a man gets a fullness of the priesthood of God, he has to get it in the same way that Jesus Christ obtained it, and that was by keeping all the commandments and obeying all the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Obeying all the ordinances of the house of the Lord. He says all men who become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ will have to receive the fullness of the ordinances of his kingdom, and those who will not receive all the ordinances will come short of the fullness of that glory if they do not lose the whole of it. See? Now, it's important, then, that we build temples, and it's through temples that we receive the endowments and are taught the principles and receive the sacred rites and covenants by which we become a Zion people. And except we become a Zion people, then we cannot be exalted. Now, for example, Zion, or the temple, is the basis of the endowment of Zion with glory. Let me turn to section 124 with you, one of the revelations that deals with the uh, temple and its relationship to Zion. And here, beginning with verse uh, 36, the Lord says this, For it is ordained that in Zion and in her stakes, and in Jerusalem, those places which I have appointed for refuge shall be the places for your baptisms for your dead. And again, verily I say unto you, How shall your washings be acceptable unto me, except ye perform them in a house which ye should build into my name? For for this cause I commanded Moses that he should build a tabernacle, and that he should bear it with them in the wilderness, 
and to build a house in the land of promise. Some people think that the temple built in ancient Israel was David's idea, which then he was forbidden to carry out, and his son Solomon finally accomplished. Note what the Lord says. Because you need temples, he says, for this reason I commanded Moses that he should build a tabernacle, that they should bear it with them in the wilderness. The tabernacle was a portable temple. And then he goes on and says, and also to build a house in the land of promise, that those ordinances might be revealed which had been hid from before the world was. And so the Lord gave Moses instructions to build a temple in ancient Israel. And it wasn't merely David's idea. He picked it up from somewhere back earlier. Now he goes on and says, Therefore verily I say unto you, that your anointings, and your washings, and your baptisms for the dead, and your solemn assemblies, and your memorials for your sacrifices by the sons of Levi, and for your oracles in the most holy places wherein you receive conversations. This is a place of revelation, and you are given the means of revelation. And your statutes and judgments, note, for the beginning of the revelations and foundation of Zion, and for the glory, honor, and endowment of all her municipals are ordained by the ordinance of my holy house, which my people are always commanded to build unto my holy name." See? Now what's Zion and what's the temple for? It's the beginning of the glory, honor, and endowment of all her municipals. Now what are municipals? Well, they're the buildings and the surrounding things in which we live and administer. See? And the design is that Zion will be glorified, and that glory will not only be in people. The buildings will be glorified, the trees will be glorified, the grass will be glorified, the beauty of the flowers will be glorified. The endowment of glory will rest on Zion and all her municipals and all her environs. And the beginning of this, then, is the temple of the Lord. That's where it comes from. That's where it has its basis. See? And we talk about the second coming and about the earth being renewed to its paradisical glory. And it's true that at the opening of the millennium, the great world appearance of Christ, that he comes in glory, the veil will be taken off, and all flesh will see him, and the wicked will be consumed, and, and uh, the earth will be purified by the power of that glory and, and spirit. But it's also true, and this sometimes we don't consider and think about, it's also true that the glory that prevails in the millennium after Christ's coming will be that glory which is built up and manifest through the temples of the Lord that are built up throughout the earth, where the saints are endowed with glory, as the Lord says in section 124, verse 39, through temple ordinances. See, when the Lord uh, endows his saints with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, he will do it through the temple and its program. Now, that's how important the temple is. And so it's important then that, that we see that and we get an orientation on Zion. How does Zion differ from Mount Zion? Zion is established upon her mount. And what is her mount? It's the temple. It's the covenants of the temple. It's the sealing powers. It's fullness of priesthood. It's becoming kings and priests. It's that holy order of the house of the Lord by which and through which we're sanctified. And then the covenants that, that are foundation include the covenant of consecration, which is one of the sacred covenants of the Melchizedek priesthood. And when we have been to the temple and received that, and then our next step is to go to the bishop and say, I'm ready to consecrate now in actual fact. And when we're ready to do that and build the Zion society and really become serious and really get the job done and sanctify our lives as we meet together and counsel each other and teach and talk and minister to each other, and we finally become a sanctified people, where the Lord then can place the sealing powers upon his people, and then endow them with glory, then we'll be somewhere near ready for the second coming. Then we'll be somewhere near ready for the second coming. See, Now, that's the job that we have to do. Now, as we talk about Zion then, uh, Let's keep in mind that this is the way that we are to come to God, to be sanctified, partake of Christ's glory. Let me suggest you just take a look at section 45 for a minute, verse uh, 8 through uh, 15, where the Lord uh, 
uh, has some important things to say. He says in verse 8, I came unto mine own, and mine own received me not. But unto as many as received me gave I power to do many miracles and to become the sons of God. Now, apply that to me. Do I have power to do many miracles, become the sons of God? If I've come in the right way, I should. Not that I'm so great, but that the Lord is in me. It isn't that there's any great big personalities in the Church. There are none of us that are great. But there are people who have gifts of the Spirit. There are people to whom the Lord has given insights in various things. And when we meet together then, recognizing our dependence on him, then we share those gifts. And we apply ourselves on the principle of true brotherhood. And on that basis, then, we become a Zion people, see? Now, early in this dispensation, one of the great revelations of modern scripture, beginning with the Book of Mormon, was the fact that the new Jerusalem would be built in America. Now, the old pioneer or, or pilgrim and Puritan fathers suspected that. And uh, I can show you statement after statement among those uh, early brethren where they talked about the building of the new Jerusalem in America. And that's an interesting thing. When they came over here, they came here not just to find a new land, they came here to establish the new Jerusalem. And uh, one important thing, though, the Book of Mormon tells us about is that the new Jerusalem would be built in America. Here in Ether chapter 13, uh, Ether, that great prophet of the Jaredite nation, uh, makes some very important uh, disclosures concerning what the Lord had shown him about it. In verse 4, Moroni writes of Ether, saying, Behold, Ether saw the days of Christ. And he spake concerning a new Jerusalem upon this land. And he spake also concerning the house of Israel and the Jerusalem from whence Lehi should come. After it should be destroyed. It should be built up again a holy city unto the Lord. Wherefore, it could not be a new Jerusalem, for it had been in time of old, but it should be built up again and become a holy city of the Lord, and it should be built unto the house of Israel, and that a new Jerusalem should be built upon this land unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which thing there was a type. And then he gives this illustration, for as Joseph brought his father down into the land of Egypt, even, even so he died there. Wherefore, the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should perish not, even as he was merciful unto the father of Joseph, that he should perish not. Wherefore, the remnant of the house of Joseph should be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they shall, be, they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old. And they shall no more be confounded until the end come when the earth shall pass away. See? Now, when people read the Book of Mormon, they knew the New Jerusalem was going to be built here. And then you read, for example, in 3 Nephi chapter 20, where the Savior confirms this as he ministers among the Nephites. And he says here, 3 Nephi 20, uh, verse 22, And behold, this people will I establish in this land unto the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob. And it shall be a New Jerusalem. And the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. See, that's where Christ is among the saints in the New Jerusalem. And this is prior to his coming in glory. See, And so they knew that. Now, knowing that, then, there were a lot of people who had some special interest in it. The question was, if it was going to be built in America, where? Where in America? And it was right at this point that this good brother, Hiram Page, we've talked about last hour or so, who had this seer stone that he found and was looking through it and getting revelations, he began to reveal to the saints many things, as he supposed, uh, concerning the New Jerusalem. And he had a ready audience, because the Book of Mormon said it was going to be built here, and here now is a prophet that's been raised up and he's going to tell us all about it. And Oliver Cowdery got led by astray by it, and uh, uh, the Lord had to straighten things out. Now, here in section 28, the Lord then, under these circumstances, gives us the first intimation as to where the New Jerusalem will be built. Note what he says, for example, uh, in verse 9. And now, behold, I say unto you that it is not revealed 
and no man knoweth, particularly Hiram Page. Okay? And no man knoweth where the city of Zion shall be built, but it shall be given hereafter. Now here's the clue. Behold, I say unto you that it shall be on the borders by the Lamanites. Now what did that term mean to people in that day? What was the western border of the United States? It was the Mississippi River, was it not? On down through there. And the Lamanites is the territory westward, okay? And so he says now, Behold, it shall be on the borders by the Lamanites, not over into Lamanite territory, but right next to the border. And uh, with that in mind, then, the Prophet Joseph Smith commissioned Oliver Cowdery uh, and uh, Peter Whitmer, Jr., Harley P. Pratt, Richard Ziva Peterson, to go on what we call in church history the Lamanite mission. They had two purposes. One was to teach the gospel to the Lamanites. <clears throat> the second purpose was to do the spade work for the establishment or the designation of the New Jerusalem. They went forth to do that work. And so as a result of their mission, they headed west. <clears throat> they went on up into New York, <clears throat> met some Indian people on down there, dropped down into the area of Kirtland, and planted the gospel there. And uh, a phenomenal conversion took place. There were several then who were baptized, and before they left, it numbered over, well over a hundred and was continued on to where it was into the thousands. Uh, in that and the surrounding areas. And then they went on down to a little outpost town called Independence in Jackson County, Missouri. And Independence was the outfitting place where you kind of jumped off into Indian Territory. If you wanted to go to Santa Fe, where well, you went to Independence and got yourself outfitted, see. And that was also the outfitting place for the trade, fur traders. And it was the point where fur traders converged and uh, sold their wares. It was a little uh, frontier situation, and these brethren went down there. And they did the basic work then to identify the place. They started the teaching of the gospel to the Indians until the Indian agents shut them off. And uh, finally then they sent word back to the prophet Joseph Smith. And in the spring of 1831, then he and a group of brethren with him went down to Jackson County. And in section 57, which was received on date of July the 20th, 1831, they were told now specifically where the center place of Zion should be. Uh, verse 2, Wherefore this, the Lord says, is the land of promise, the place for the city of Zion. And thus saith the Lord your God, it shall be, if you receive wisdom, here is wisdom. Behold, the place which is now called Independence is the center place. Now Zion is likened to a tent. It has a center place, and then it has supporting stakes around about. And that center place, then, is an administrative hub. There's a high council in Zion, which, when it was organized in 1834, the summer of 34, was considered to be a general authority body. And when it's going reorganized as the New Jerusalem is established or the center place of the New Jerusalem, then it will be another body of brethren uh, with its center in the center place of Zion with administrative authority in all the states of Zion round about. And it will be that kind of, of program. Now that uh, uh, is what the Lord designates. He says, And the spot where the temple is lying westward upon a lot which was not far from the courthouse. Now, having that designation, then the Lord gave another revelation here in section 58, in which he makes it clear that the redemption of Zion was not to be immediate in his understanding of things. Note how he puts it, verse 3, beginning. Ye cannot behold, he says, with your natural eyes for the present, and keep in mind the date of this was August 1st, 1831. 
And the prophet never dedicated the land of Zion until August the 2nd and the temple of Zion until August the 3rd. And so this revelation then was given before there was any commitment in regard to the center place or in regard to the temple that was to be built there. Now note what the Lord says. You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. Now the glory has reference to the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Much tribulation has reference to what? Well, the whole scenario of being run from Jackson County into northern Missouri and out of Missouri westward and whatever else it will entail, the tribulation that will come to the saints until we finally get a body of Latter-day Saints who are truly prepared to build the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> and after Zion has been cleansed and the righteous remnant has been brought out by the circumstances of that cleansing, then you'll have a body of people <coughs> where the Lord's vision here can be fulfilled. Now he goes on and says, <clears throat> For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh, that ye shall be crowned with much glory, the hour is not yet, but nigh at hand. Remember this, which I tell you before, he says, that you may lay it to heart and receive that which is to follow. Now the prophet later, after he had been run out of Missouri, refers back to that. He says, Now the Lord told us about this, see? Eh? Lay this to heart. And then the Lord says, Remember this when he I tell you before that you may receive that which is to follow. Behold, verily I say unto you, For this cause have I sent you. And then he identifies uh, five major reasons why he has sent these brethren down. Number one, that you may be obedient. And that's always a good one. Number two, that your hearts might be prepared to bear testimony of the things which are to come, both in the sense of glory and in the sense of judgments, which he warned them about. Number three, that you might be honored in laying the foundation and in bearing record of the land upon which the Zion of God shall stand. He says, he didn't say that you'll be honored in building it. He says you'll be honored in laying the foundation and bearing record of the land. Uh, number four, verse eight, and also that a feast of fat things might be prepared for the poor. Yea, the feast of fat things and wine on the least, well refined, that the earth may know that the mouths of the prophets shall not fail. Now, this feast of fat things is the Zion order and the Zion society, and it's symbolic also of the marriage feast of the Lord and has reference to both. Now, he goes on and says, <clears throat> Yea, a supper of the house of the Lord, well prepared, unto which all nations shall be invited. First the rich and the learned, the wise and the noble. And that has reference to the Gentile nations in their time of power and glory. And then he says, <clears throat> uh, After that cometh the day of my power. Uh, as the Lord says in section 9, In the day of the Lord's power. And it's going to be a day of power. And we'll talk about that in, in the, the, the discussions tonight and tomorrow and Saturday evening. He says, Then shall the poor and the lame and the blind and the deaf come into the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, this is the gathering of scattered Israel. Uh, and he says finally then in verse 5 that the testimony might not uh, might go forth from Zion, yea, from the mouth of the city of the heritage of the Lord. Well, so the Lord designated the center place, and he also laid the foundation prophetically of what uh, was going to happen thereafter in the way of judgments and cleansing and preparatory actions. Now, let's leave it at this point. Uh, uh, let me just say again that, uh, that in order to establish this program, the way to Zion is the way of the gospel, and it's the way of the temple. It's the way of the gospel, and it's the way of the temple. It's the way of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's the way that leads us to be kings and priests unto God and to rule and reign with him in the eternal house of Israel. See? And when we get that order built up, then we'll have Zion, because that's the end result of that order to build. And uh, Christ is the great king of Zion. He is the Lord and the God of Zion. And uh, Zion is the thing that he thinks most precious in his mind, aside from his children. And it ranks on a par even 
with the sacredness of his children because it's only when you get Zion that you get everything else that's worthwhile. That's why Isaiah was so infatuated with Zion. He knew that when Zion was established, Israel would be gathered. He knew that when Zion was established, peace would be established in the earth, and the lamb would lie down with the lion. He knew that when Zion was set, that the Lord would reign. He knew that when Zion was established, the earth would be renewed to its glory and its power. He knew all those things were conditional upon Zion. And so Zion is the, the great thing that the Lord loves. He's the God of Zion, and he loves Zion, and it's his desire to build it. May the Lord bless us, my brothers and sisters, that we might grasp a little of that vision and that love in our lives and do it, and then share with the Lord in the joy that he has and the reward he has with him for those who build Zion. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We can have some questions. Is Zion a society of people who have all received sanctification? The answer is yes. What kind of earthly employment would you expect a sanctified person to be engaged in? Zion, the employment of Zion isn't something that is foreign to us. It's rather the infusion of God's law and of his truth and his spiritual power into what we do. And that includes every profession, including lawyers. It does. It includes every profession. It's the sanctification of every profession. But not only we've got to be sanctified, we've got to sanctify our professions. And there's more, as we've hinted here already, we need to be sanctified more than others. <laughs> All right, who of the 144,000 will be with Christ? Will any of them be saints not born of parents in the church? These people will be men who have, uh, and they won't be just limited to this dispensation. There will be those from past dispensations, and there will be those from earlier times in this dispensation who will be raised up and uh, uh, who will administer this last great program of the gathering of the righteous. Uh, and this gathering won't be just the converting of them and gathering to Utah, Arizona, or somewhere in Western America. This gathering is to the temple, to the Holy of Holies, to the fullness of priesthood, to the endowment of glory. See, it's that gathering. And they perform that work. And then when Christ comes in his glory, the only people that are going to be caught up to meet him, the only people that will be caught up to meet him in, in the clouds of heaven will be the church of the firstborn. He's not going to have a bunch of Gentile saints caught up there. We'd all be burned like bedbugs in a bonfire. I mean, he's going to, he's going to gather the church of the firstborn. Read section 78. It tells us that, see? How there will be those who abide the day of his coming. Uh, the heathen nations will. They won't be burned. The telestial elements, the corrupt elements, they will be consumed, but the others will abide the day, but those who are caught up with him into the clouds will be those who have been sanctified and who have been brought in to the church of the firstborn through the ministry of the 144,000. And there's a lot more to it than that. We may get to it if we have a little time later. Will there be more than one who will lead the 144,000, such as Christ himself, or will he commission one in mortal form to play a part in the building? Uh, you understand the book of Revelation. Understand that uh, that uh, uh, John the Revelator will have a role in this. So also will the four great gospel angels who have restored the gospel in uh, earlier times. And I refer to Peter and to Moses and to Elias and to Elijah. Uh, they will have a role to play in this work. Uh, but also there will be a living prophet on earth. And uh, the divine beings and eternal beings will communicate and carry out work then through the living prophets. Are the 144 uh, couples or priesthood holders only? Are the 144 couples or priesthood? And the answer is yes. They've got to have fullness of priesthood. And uh, each of them will have a, a beautiful wife. We will play a part in that. I want you sisters to know that. We get the idea that the only way you can hold the priesthood is to hold your hubby. And I, I counsel you to do that. But anyone who's been to the temple knows that women administer in priesthood ordinances. Now, in the church, you do not. But in the temple and in the Zion order, women do admin, hold and administer priesthood rites in connection, as Joseph Smith, and that's the term he used, in connection with their husbands, see? And that's true of the 144,000. 
Is 144,000 an absolute figure, or is it figurative? If absolute, why continue to enlarge the Church? <laughs> well, I want to get in, first of all. <laughs> I don't know whether it's absolute. The, all we have is the general statement on it. But if you read Revelation chapter 7, you have 144,000, and with them a huge multitude that no man could number. And so these are the brethren who hold the keys to develop the program, and there are others then who receive the benefits and glory and uh, powers related to that program, and they're part of it. And so, yes, you can enlarge the Church, although you may not be a member of 144,000 per se. Is, uh, if these pure men are called to be uh, of the 144,000 are married, wouldn't their wives also have that calling with them? And the answer is, yeah, in a sense, that's, I don't. Uh, uh, I see again, if we're dealing with the temple, and do righteous women administer ordinances in relation to the temple? <clears throat> and if you know the answer to that, you know the answer to what he's talking about here. And if so, does 144,000 include the wives? As it, uh, or is 144,000 priesthood? 144,000 are priesthood holders, but, uh, but there's a marriage relationship there, okay? And the wives are on, are an added addition to that number. Yeah, if you're just talking about bodies, yeah, there's more than 144,000 bodies. Okay. Are there presently persons or groups who have consecrated their belongings to the Church and are living as Zion people? In this formal sense that the law of consecration is applied, the answer is no, not that I know of. Uh, you might have some of the general authority to give full time and that kind of thing, and, and you might consider them as being pretty close to it, but not in the sense of implementing the law as we know it. Will Zion be established prior to the Holocaust, or will the people who are protected under the cloud of glory go to establish Zion following the Holocaust? Zion will be cleansed and purified during the Holocaust, and there will be those of the saints who will perish physically, but then those who remain and abide and endure, this will be the righteous element. During the millennium, will the land be level or flat with the absence of mountains? And the answer is no. The mountains will be leveled and the valleys will be exalted. <coughs> the Lord doesn't. The Lord wasn't born in Kansas. <coughs> <coughs> now, he's a mountain man. <laughs> he is. He's a mountain man. <laughs> and he's just not going to put everything down table level, believe me. <laughs> yes, there'll be mountains that'll be leveled and there'll be valleys that'll be exalted. And you just kind of turn things around, but you're going to have some beautiful scenery in the moment. <laughs> All right, during the millennium, as resurrected beings will we spend a thousand years during the temple work, doing the temple work for the living and the dead. No resurrected being will minister in the temple. You've got to have living people in mortality doing that. See, we uh, raise the children that die as youngsters. Yes, women, for example, who lose their children. Uh, if they're worthy, we'll have those children resurrected to the same stature of physical being that they were when they laid in the grave, and they will have the privilege and opportunity of raising those children in the millennial society. Do we need to live the law of consecration in its fullness before Christ comes? And the answer is yes. Will the Lamanites and or Nephites, <coughs> whose land this uh, land, whose land this land is, their inheritance, lead? the building of the New Jerusalem. How does Ephraim be involved in that great work? Now, the answer to that is that the Lord has given this land not merely to the Lamanites and the Indian people. He brought the pilgrims here. He brought the Puritans here. He established the great constitution of this land. He gave it to our fathers as much as he gave it to any of those people. See, And the fact is that their fathers apostatizing program, and therefore uh, rejected the initial offer of gift to them. And while they're still here in bodies, then the Lord has given this land uh, to others. And these others, then, are richly impregnated physically with the blood of Israel. <clears throat> and they have just as much a right to this choice land by blood as any of the children of Lehi. In fact, there are many among them that have much more right by blood than do uh, the seed of Lehi. See? So when, if you read, for example, the Lord's appointments, the land in and around the New Jerusalem is given to the saints, is given to Ephraim, and the Indian people as a people will not inherit that land. Rather, instead, they will 
receive their endowments, their blessings, their gospel, they'll go back to the lands of their and they'll build up Zion in their midst. Some of them may live, yes, in and around the center place of Zion. Now, the idea that the Indian people are going to build the New Jerusalem is a misinterpretation of 3rd Nephi 21. The Lord says there that the converted Gentiles, and he's talking of Gentiles, purely Gentile by blood, will assist two people, groups, the remnant of Jacob, the Indian people, and others of the house of Israel. Now, if you read, for example, section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you find that the Lord talks about the redemption of Zion and the blessings that come from it. And he says this, that the ten tribes, he says, will come to Zion and be crowned with glory. Now, they're not going to be converted to the gospel. They've already got that. They're going to be crowned with glory, receive those ultimate and final ordinances. And he says, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim's going to give them those endowments of glory after we've got on the stick and, and got them ourselves. See? And then he says, and they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. Now, why the richer blessing? Not because of favoritism, but because Ephraim has borne the heat of the day. It was Ephraim that went through the refiner's fire. It was Ephraim, the group at least, the righteous remnant, that came out of that refiner's fire and had the endowments of the Spirit, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, see? And they went and established the new Jerusalem. Now, meantime, at that time, there will be a great conversion of many of the Indian people, and they will participate. And properly understood that statement in 3rd Nephi 21 means that the converted Gentiles who are pure Gentiles in blood will assist the Lamanites who will assist those who hold the keys, namely Ephraim. And the idea that we're going to give the New Jerusalem program to the Indian people and they are going to do it is simply a rank misconception of the greatest order. See? And we see that expressed in so many times, a uh, distortion of it, but it simply is not true. There's nothing to bear that out. <clears throat> well, that's my diary for the day. What is meant by <clears throat> in the name of the Father written in their foreheads in connection with 144,000? <clears throat> In the teachings, page 321, the prophet Joseph Smith deals with uh, that, and he says this, uh, Four destroying angels hold power of the four corners of the earth until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies, here's what it means, which signifies sealing the blessings, that is, the temple blessings, including forms of priesthood and the sealing powers, Sealing the blessings upon their heads, meaning the new and everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. And so that term then has to do with uh, uh, sealing the powers, the attributes, the authority of the Father in their foreheads through the sacred sealing ordinances of the temple. In the temple, when he, we make covenants, haven't we covenanted covenants that are a part of the church of the firstborn? And the answer is yes. The temple is there to build up. Read the teachings, page 237 on that one if you got it. Uh, please clarify Moses, clarify Moses 7.16 in relation to Ether 3.15. <clears throat> well, let's get to where we're not sure. Moses uh, 7.16. <clears throat> uh, And from that time forth there were wars and bloodsheds among them, but the Lord came and dwelt with his people, and uh, they dwelt in righteousness. With Ether chapter 3, verse 15, uh, where the brother of Jared, the Lord to the brother of Jared, and that's the chapter that concerns it, verse 15, And never have I shown unto myself whom I have treated, and never as man be received me, believed in me as thou hast. Oh, I see the idea. I think what he's getting to is, if uh, the Lord dwelt among them, then how can he say to either who lived there later that uh, never have I shown myself unto man, never as thou believed me as thou hast? That's always been a problem in passage. It doesn't say it doesn't have an answer, because it does. Uh, <clears throat> And let me just put it this way. 
the, the brother of Jared experience. See, Christ manifests himself both as the Father and as the Son, and at times jointly, both in a dual capacity. When he manifested himself unto Enoch, he manifested himself as in the office, power, and capacity of the Father. And the first time, and then he revealed himself to be the Son. Now, the first time that he manifested himself in the office, power, and capacity of the Son, and then revealed himself that he was also the father with the brother of Jared. And when he says, Never have I, the Son, shown myself unto man whom I have created, for never hast man believed in me as thou hast. Now, the brother of Jared not only wanted to see him, but he saw his finger, and he saw that uh, it was finger that he thought was flesh. And what he saw then was a visual portrayal of the finger of Christ as though he were living in the flesh. And so the, the Savior goes on and says, or Moni explains, he says, uh, uh, Jesus says to him, Behold, this body which you have, behold, is the body of my spirit, and man have I created after the body of my spirit, but even as I appear in the spirit, I appear in people in the flesh. And then Moroni says, And now, as I am well, I have said, I could not give a full account of these things uh, written. Therefore, it suffices me to say that Jesus showed himself unto this man in the spirit, now note, even after the manner in which and in the likeness of the same body as he showed himself unto the Nephites. It wasn't just that he saw him as spirit. He saw him as though he would appear among the Nephites. And this, then, was his role as the son. And then that being who made that disclosure of himself, not just a spirit personage, but as he would be on earth, and as he would manifest himself in the resurrection to the Nephites, that being who portrayed to the brother of Jed that vision of those things, then revealed that he was also the Father, see? Now, and this is the first time that that kind of revelation had been given, not that he had never appeared to man before, because the Lord appeared unto Adam in the valley of Adam on Diamond. Did that Father Adam have temples? And the answer is yes. Recently, I heard the rumor that in Salt Lake City, a sermon meeting of Provo, that all 144,000 would be chosen from Ephraim, not from any other tribe. Well, that's contrary to Scripture. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 makes it clear that it's chosen from all the tribes of Israel. If one will not be taken up uh, his sword against his neighbor and free design, is it a single, uh, is it a single place or or still the pure in heart, wherever they are. Read the teachings, page 160, where the prophet talks about that, and, and he says this, There will be here and there a stake of Zion for the gathering of the saints. Some have cried peace, but the saints of the world will have little peace from henceforth. Let this not hinder us from fleeing to the stakes. He says, There your children will be blessed, and you in the midst of friends where you will be blessed. Let me just put it this way. The New Jerusalem isn't just a city in Jackson County. That's the center place of the New Jerusalem. That's the city of Zion. The New Jerusalem is a complex of cities of 15 to 20,000 each in size, beginning with the Appalachian Mountains in the east and extending to the Pacific in the west with no north or south boundary. Now, that's how Joseph Smith was given to understand in a revelation he received in the fall of 1830 which unfortunately was lost, but we have some references to it from some of the correspondence of the day. Uh, so the New Jerusalem, then, is a complex of cities. And when you talk about building the New Jerusalem, you're not talking about just building a particular place. Uh, Kevin, comment upon more about, upon op- more about uh, opens up the onslaught of the adversary against the individual. Well, I don't know that anything more needs really to be said on that. It's like Brigham Young said. Uh, and this is the General Discourses, Volume 3, page 205, if you've got a set at home. He says, uh, Does the Lord uh, allow the adversary a uh, greater onslaught on the saints by having revelation, they're having revelations, than by they're not having them? And he says, Yes, he does. Now, one illustration of it will be as you read the power of the adversary in the book of Revelation, where he calls down power, fire from heaven, and all of that. That will be after Zion is endowed with glory. And then the adversary will be permitted a commensurate power in opposition to that. And it's that kind of opposition that will centralize finally that last great battle of Gog and Magog, and there are two battles of 
Gog and Magog, one before the millennium and one after, but the last great battle after the millennial period, when you really have a power situation, because the adversary will have the right by the principle of opposition, if I can put it that way, to manifest a commensurate power against the righteous to that which they have received and been endowed with during the millennial period. And this can be a real blast, that one is, really. Well, that runs out of it, except for maybe one or two that might not be appropriate to answer. We'll uh, see you at uh, 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Appreciate your endurance to the end. Uh, we'll see you then.